What a joy it is to come into the presence of God. Don't you agree? Would you put your hands together and praise our God this morning? And so even as you stand, would you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6? Um, and, I, you know, th this is a great, great, great uh, letter. The more I'm reading it, the more I realize what a, what a, what a letter it is by Paul um, and teaching us so many, so many things. And so we're going to read Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we, we've been studying about the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. And I want to touch a little bit on that. And um, I'm going to talk on that. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. I'm on, huh? by the way. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armors so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you, you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will, be st you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'd be fully prepared. In addition to all of this, Hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the, of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Amen. You may be seated. Am I on? Okay. Okay. So we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how um, spiritual transformation takes place. I mean, what is the goal of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life? We talked about how on the day of salvation, we may be morally transformed, but unless we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we will not be spiritually transformed. The goal of God for us, every Christian believer, is that we would be spiritually transformed. We, that we move to a place where not only we recognize the difference between good and bad, but we recognize the difference between uh, what comes from God and what comes from devil. What's born out of God, what's born out of devil. And that we move to a place where we um, hear the heart of God, where we sense the mission of God in such a way that we will never question the will of God in our lives. You know, we all struggle with, what is the will of God for my life? If any one of us is struggling with, what is the will of God for my life? That simply means we have not yet been fully transformed spiritually. That we need the Holy Spirit uh, to move us into a place where we hear the heartbeat of God and move according to his drumbeat. Not our plans, our wishes, our desires. There is no more self, self dies. God lives inside us. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when he anoints us, he may bring gifts to us, spiritual gifts. And that he would empower us in such a way that we'd bear fruit. The focus is not the gifts, neither the fruit. The focus is what he's doing inside. He transforms us so that we then bear fruit through our lives. That's what we talked about. And that's where God wants all of us to go to. And most of us don't go there. Now, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul wants to warn us, uh, listen, um, you've got to be aware of what is really happening around you. You may think that uh, what you see around you is, is really your enemy, but that's not your enemy at all. Your enemy is unseen. Um, he is a smart guy. He's got strategies that you need to remember and you need to know uh, in order for you to have complete victory in your life and experience true freedom in your life. So he doesn't want us to be unaware of Satan's strategies in our lives. 
So I'm, I'm, I talked about it, you know, things that last week. What keeps us from being fully spiritually transformed? How Satan keeps us away from being transformed fully into the likeness of Christ? Uh, um, how Satan actually operates? That's what we talked uh, last week. And I just want to explore a little more on that today, give you a little more insight into um, how Satan controls us. And let, well, let's just, just me recap what we have done last week. Just in case you missed out, you, you probably want to go back to last week's first service sermon, because second service we had a guest speaker. First service sermon, and just listen to this a little more on a deeper level. Remember this. Either you are under spirit's control or you are under Satan's control. Nobody is ever fully in charge of their life. None of you can ever claim that I am in charge of my life. You are not. You may say, well, I know I'm not a great Christian. I, I believe in Jesus. I'm following Jesus. But I'm not a bad person. I don't do bad things. Um, nobody is in that position. You are either in the control of the Holy Spirit or you are under the control of Satan. Let's just get, uh, get that fact very clear. Scripture declares that, says that all of us are either in the control of the Holy Spirit or we are in the control of the Satan. One of them is controlling us. You just cannot say, uh, I am in charge of my life. We talked about that. God gave us the freedom of choice. Um, at the Garden of Eden, it, it became very clear to us how we use, the, we use that freedom of choice. Satan will influence us by using words, images, things, objects, people to make the kind of decisions that we make. Choice is ours, yes. We are the ones who are making the decision. But we are influenced by Satan. The moment we make a decision by the influence of Satan, we then go into the control of Satan. But the moment we refuse him and choose to follow what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us through the scripture, decide to reject the Satan's uh, influence over your life and choose to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you are in the control of the Holy Spirit. But all of us are there or here. One of those two things. Let's just remember that. And I talked about how most of us are, uh, you know, unawarely uh, are under the, um, you know, dominion of Satan. Let's understand how Satan operates in this world. I talked extensively last week on this, so I'll just brief through that, run through that, just in case you missed out. Paul explained that in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12. He gave us the hierarchy of Satan, how Satan operates. Remember this truth. Satan is not God. That's number one. First thing, remember this. Satan is not God. Satan is not equal to God. Satan is anywhere, not even anywhere close to God. Not nothing, nothing like God. Satan is just like us, a creature. Remember that. He's not God. That simply means he doesn't have power. He doesn't have the power more than what God gave him. That's it. Okay? So it also means that Satan can only be at one place at one time. He cannot be everywhere. Which simply means right now if he's not in dream center, he's somewhere else. That's it. Maybe in... I don't want to name the countries, but this is somewhere there. If he's there, he cannot be here. Okay? Because he's not omnipresent. Number two, Satan doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what's happening in your life. God is omniscient, not you, not Satan, not anybody else. Only God knows what's happening in our life. Only God knows what we are thinking. Only God knows what's the future. Satan doesn't know. Satan can predict based on the history, but Satan doesn't know anything about our future. Only God knows. Remember that. So he is not omniscient. He doesn't know every secret of your life. Okay? That doesn't mean you can do secret sins. That's not what it means. It simply means he doesn't know. And because he is incapable of operating like God, he then uses those who are under him to operate on behalf of him all over the world. Along with Satan, there are fallen angels who had fallen along with him onto this world, who then become his army. He's, he uses principalities. Paul uses the first word, principalities, who are basically the powers, uh, uh, territorial powers, uh, who are controlling nations um, all across, geographical nations all across the world, 
every country is under some kind of principality who is controlling that nation. Um, our country may have more, but this is say one. <laughs> you know, uh, Daniel, you remember the book of Daniel talks about how uh, Gabriel uh, says to Daniel, Daniel, I was trying to bring up news to you, but the principality of Persia stopped me from reaching out to you. So therefore, God sent Michael to fight against him. And after he defeated him, I came and brought you the news. So principalities of this world. Then there are powers, which then use, uh, receive the authority from the principalities and operate in different levels. Um, well, let's call them centurions, uh, uh, you know, a second mid-level management guys. And then, of course, there are um, rulers. Um, actually, the, the word Paul used is raw force, which simply means like an army. The army of evil spirits that work all around the world, um, afflicting people, affecting people, possessing people um, and their lives, their journeys. And forces of the wickedness, that's what he uses the word. The fourth word, forces of wickedness, are, are forces that are um, controlling people through religion, through ideologies. Um, they captive people, uh, you know, with those, um, with those uh, religiosity and uh, uh, ideologies. Um, you know, sometimes we may disagree with religion, but because we belong to certain religion, we kind of controlled by that spirit, you know. Um, so Satan operates effectively like that. He just cannot do things on his own. He has to have people. And so he uses all these forces to control the world. Jesus called Satan the ruler of the world. In John chapter 12, verses 21 and 32. When Jesus called Satan the ruler of the world, it does not mean God appointed Satan to be the ruler of the world. Remember that. God did not appoint Satan to be the ruler of the world. God allowed Satan to be the ruler of the world. Do you know who God appointed to be the ruler of this world? In Genesis chapter 1, verses 28, God gave the first command to man, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over the world. In other words, God is saying, listen, I created the world for you. That's what he's saying. We are created for God. The world is created for us. Do you remember that? The conditions of the world are shaped in such a way so that we can live in this world. That's why God created the world first and then placed us there. And then told, I'm giving you first command. My first command to you is be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over this world, govern it. So technically, who is appointed to be the ruler of this world? We. We are supposed to be the stewards of this world. We are supposed to take care of this world. We are supposed to be the ones who should rule this world. But instead of that, when Satan came and influenced Adam and Eve, saying that, why don't you eat the fruit of life? Because if you eat the fruit of life, you will become like God. Eve and Adam got influenced by what Satan proposed and thought, if I eat the fruit, then I'll become like God. They who, the choice is still Adam's, remember? Influence came from Satan. The moment they took the fruit of the tree of life and disobeyed the command of God, they chose to obey the influence of Satan. In other words, Adam and Eve gave their appointment to Satan by disobeying God. So really, we are the ones who give rule of our, over our lives and this world to Satan, not God. God didn't give. God did not appoint Satan there. We gave our appointment to him because we wanted to be like gods. Instead of be becoming gods, we became slaves to Satan. Really, I feel so sad for ourselves, you know, that it was supposed to be us who are to be stewards of this world. And so Satan then took control of everything and is influencing every one of us through everything that is under him. I talked about five ways of control, demonic control in this world. Five levels of control in this world. Uh, five levels of control in your life. 
all of us would fall into one of those areas. And um, you know, possibly uh, most of us would fall in the first three. Uh, and I'm hoping that nobody else is in the fourth here. Um, <laughs> Um, because obviously you would have manifested by now, uh, just in case you are on the fourth level. Uh, so uh, level one talks about that we are uh, either oppressed by Satan, physically, socially, or religiously, either in any one of those areas. Satan would use evil spirits, evil forces to attack us physically with infirmity, sickness, uh, uh, or even jails and persecution on Christians, um, if you're not, if you're, if you're not a Christian, if you do not know Jesus as your personal savior, Satan can attack you with sickness. Remember that. Um, or there may be a social oppression upon you, um, you know, because of the kind of ethnicity you hold, or you know, in our community, the community in our India, you know, uh, the community which you, you belong to, um, things like that. He would use social barriers or religious barriers in order to bring oppression upon you. The second level, I, I've, I've talked about this last week, so I'm not just going to expand on this. Um, and then the second level of demonic control is what we call suppression. If he, does, if he cannot attack you from outside, he will attack you from within. Meaning he will let your fear be the one that controls you. Or he will let your pride be the one that controls you. See, either we are, uh, you know, some of us who do not have our identity rooted in Christ, we are living a fearful life, or we are living a pride-filled life. One of those two is happening. If, you, if Christ is not your final authority, you are living under the slavery of spirit of fear, or you are living under the slavery of spirit of pride. Okay, remember that. This is controlling you from within. So your fear stops you from doing what you are supposed to do, achieving your full potential. God has a great plan for your life. Uh, he's, he's already created you with a full potential. But you will not be able to reach there if you allow your, either your fear or your pride control you. Satan uses that to suppress your true potential. Then number three, the third level of demonic control in our lives is what we call obsession, uh, which simply means being preoccupied. Being preoccupied is simply this, that you are distracted by something that is keeping you occupied. Um, un uh, ungodly desires within you, um, uh, uncontrolled desires. Like um, Samson, who is uncontrollable because of the desire of, uh, uh, the, the, the spirit of lust within him. He's, you remember, he jumps from one relationship to another relationship. Uh, in fact, he was supposed to be the ruler of Israel, which he never was. He always was with some woman who God directly prohibited to be with. Um, he, he lived his entire life caught by that spirit of lust. Saul is another classic example of being caught by the spirit of power, authority. Saul was a timid guy, fear-filled guy. God uh, brought you know, confidence in him, faith in him, gave him a kursi, um, you know, make him, made him the king. But this guy's entire life is about that kurchi, right, the chair. He lived his life trying to protect that chair, trying to protect his kingship. Uh, he listened to people, listened to others, because he was, trying, he was saying, I don't want to lose my position. He lived his life controlled by an uncontrollable desire. Um, Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, who were controlled by the spirit of greed. They had greed controlling them. That even though they vowed to serve God by giving away what they had. After they sold, because they got more money than they, what they expected, they, they became greedy. And they decided to hide something and bring only little to God. Uh, and lie in the presence of God. You remember, Peter asked them, is that all you got? Now, Peter may not actually know that they got more. He probably just asked them, Did you, is that all you got? And they lied. And the moment they lied, Spirit of God told Peter what they were doing. And God killed them on the spot. You think Old Testament only God kills? <laughs> just, just, just remember that. Just in case you forget. So being obsessed by things that are, um, um, that are not good for us. Then, of course, possession 
is another area of control where um, um, Satan, um, sorry, evil spirits are coming inside you and living into you. Now, evil spirit can never come into your life unless you invite it to come in. Remember that. Nobody can be possessed by an evil spirit unless that person decides to allow the spirit to come inside. That means you made a deliberate choice not to allow Jesus to be the king of your life and you opened your heart and your life to an evil spirit to come in, dwell inside you. Um, and I'm sure none of you are right now possessed. You may be affected by the evil spirit but not possessed uh, because I would have had a really troublesome service right now if you did have one. Uh, and then, of course, the fifth area is, is what we call incarnation. It simply means uh, this particular person is either possessed by Satan or the top tier guy, right? You remember the principalities of the world um, of a powerful spirit um, that moved them to a place of repro uh, reprobation. It simply means they will never be saved. They have come to a place where they have denied God, but not just denied God, but blasphemed God. Now remember this. Now I'm sure none of you ever did this, but remember this. Don't ever make fun of the Spirit of God. Ever. Not even at thought level. Don't ever do that. Even if you don't agree with Pentecostals, even if you don't agree with the manifestations of the Pentecostal uh, experience, you may not. And so I understand that some of us may have a little different theological opinion on uh, the expression of um, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I understand that. I don't have any problem with that. Okay? I, I may not agree with you, but I understand that. You know, you're different from me. But that does not mean you have the right to make fun of anybody who is living in the Holy Spirit. The reason I'm saying that is because this. The moment you make fun of the Holy Spirit, your salvation is gone. You are beyond redemption anymore. You, you don't have redemption after that. You can blaspheme Jesus, blaspheme Father, and still get away with that. You can never blaspheme the Holy Spirit and then get away with that. Because the only person who can convict you of your sin and lead you to, to, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. And if you make fun of him and blaspheme him, you don't have hope. Make sense? So be careful of how you think or talk about uh, Holy Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. As I told you, we may disagree on some finer points of the expression of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, just, they're just superficial. Let's not. I'd rather go to heaven than speak in tongues. I'm okay with not speaking in tongues. I want to go to heaven. Do you understand? I want to be, I, I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. I want to speak in tongues. But that does not mean uh, I, you know, that's the only thing that I'm living for. I want to go to heaven first. So you rather go to heaven. Forget about speaking in tongues. You rather go to heaven first. So be careful with that. Up to that point, am I okay with you? Right? So um, when a person moves to that place, he's, he has, he's beyond redemption. He has a reprobate mind. Um, uh, that means the conscience is not going to convict him anymore. Holy Spirit, we will not use the con con conscience to convict you anymore. Uh, that's what happened to Judas. You remember when Jesus broke the bread and gave it to Judas? Judas took it and ate it. Bible actually says Satan entered into him. Did you know that's the only place Bible talks about Satan entering into a man? And of course, later on in Revelation, you will see Antichrist is possessed by Satan. Um, that's really interesting. So when Satan came into his life, there is no, there's no back for him. There's no way back for him. That's why, that's why he was called son of perdition, son of destruction. He's gone. So I'm, I'm definitely sure none of us are there anyway. Um, but just giving you, th this is how Satan controls. Any, you know, all of us either would be under the oppression or under suppression or obsession. And um, rarely a Christian would ever be affected by evil spirit in the sense of possession. You will be attacked by an uh, evil spirit but you will not be possessed by an evil spirit because you, you have somebody else inside you, right? Who is inside you? Are you guys confident about it? No, then say, why don't you say it with confidence? Who is, who is inside you? 
Jesus is living inside you. And as long as he's the king of your life, nobody else can come inside. Unless you say, Jesus, would you like to get out and I want somebody else to come in. Unless you say that. Okay? Which I'm sure in your right mind you would not do that. <laughs> but, um, so while I'm thinking about this, and I felt um, there, there is a little more a truth that I, I do need to expose you to. Um, and it's really important for us to, to, to understand uh, how Satan strategically works and holds our lives in his hand. I want to talk about um, um, strongholds on the basis of which Satan um, keeps you from seeing the truth. Okay, let me explain that concept to you. Um, by the way, I, I cannot teach everything. And I, I know this would be foolish for me to think that I can teach everything today. And so we, we in fact, a lot of, lot of uh, uh, you know, you guys are talking to me and, and you're saying, would you, would you, would you just, why don't you take a little more time and do on this? So on the 26th of November, um, that is the last Saturday of, of um, this month, right? we are in now of this month, we, we're going to have a one-day in-depth seminar on spiritual warfare. We'll talk about how, you know, Satan builds his lies on us and how do we destroy them, how do we break those and live free, free life. Is that okay? And I'll talk more on spiritual gifting and how do you work on, um, uh, you know, operate with spiritual gifts. What are the spiritual gifts God gave you? All those things. I'll, I'll give you glimpses of that over the next few Sundays, Sunday mornings, but that would be the day you probably want to be there if you want to learn more. And I'm, I'm hoping by the end of this message you want to know more. Okay? Uh, uh, let's think about this. Imagine this is your life. I'm just using heart as an example. This is you. Um, your life is, um, you know, uh, is, has deep roots on, on certain beliefs. These are all your strongholds, the trenches. Um, your entire life is based on certain beliefs that are deeply rooted inside you at the subconscious level. Remember that. Those are your roots. Those are the ones um, that will keep you firm or uproot you. Either one of those things. Okay? These roots are, are, are strengthened by what goes inside your heart, what comes into your heart. Either the Spirit of God is sending something into your life, or Satan is sending something into your life. Okay? There's a constant input into your life. What does the Spirit of God send into our lives? He sends truth into our lives. God is truth, Bible says. Now, um, you remember the time when uh, um, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, what do you think I am? And Peter confessed, Jesus, I, I know you are the son of God. No one can have the kind of words that you have. No one can do the things that you are doing. You must be from God. So we believe that you are the son of God, the Messiah. And the moment he said that, Jesus looked at Peter and said, because you confessed that truth, on that truth, I will build my kingdom. Remember that. Jesus is building his kingdom not on Peter, but on the truth he confessed. That's the rock. Okay? So God builds his kingdom on the basis of truth. God builds your life on the basis of truth. How do I get the truth? And that's what you have in your head. So whatever uh, you are reading and whatever is going into your heart through this, as the Holy Spirit reveals to you, is the one that becomes your basis. That becomes your root. He builds your life on the truth. But on the opposite, Satan builds his kingdom in our lives through lies. Obviously. Jesus, in John chapter 8, talking to Pharisees, who asked him the question, hey, what authority are you speaking this from? He said, I come from somebody None of you know, and uh, you will never know him, the Father, unless you see me. And whatever I'm saying, it comes from the Father. Whatever I'm saying, I'm saying on behalf of the Father. Then they said, no, 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 we have only one Father, that is Abraham. We are Abraham's children. That's what Pharisees were trying to argue with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, 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 you are not, you are not Abraham's children. If you were Abraham's children, by now you would have realized I'm the Messiah. If you really, because Abraham believed me already. Abraham saw me 
even before I came to this world and believed that I am the Messiah. You, you can't claim yourself as the children of Abraham because you don't actually believe in me. So they got really mad. They said, who are we belong to then? Your father is a different guy, Jesus said. He's Satan, he's devil. You are children of devil, he said. How come we are children of devil? Because you believe in his lies. Devil is the father of lies. God is truth. Devil is the father of lies. The way God builds his kingdom, the way God builds you up is on the basis of truth. He reveals the truth to you. If you accept the truth, he will build you. Satan brings lies into your life. If you believe his deception, if you accept his deception, then he will build his kingdom in your life. He builds his kingdom on the basis of lies. So either my life is built on the lies that Satan brought into my, me, and I believed, I purchased those, those, those lies, and I believed them, or I believe the truth that comes from the scripture, and my life is built on that. Now, I know many of us have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and yet, many of us still have certain lies at the subconscious level that are still controlling us. Uh, that's how Satan entrants uh, himself inside our hearts, inside our lives, with using those lies. And so I want to expose some of them to you today. I call them strongholds of Satan within our lives. Now, the, the, what I'm about to reveal to you is applied both for Christians and non-Christians, remember? More so for those who do not know Jesus Christ, less for Christians, but still true for Christians too. Um, so you really want to listen to this. Um, I want to talk about 10 strongholds um, that Satan builds in a person's life, in our life. Now, as I told you, explaining the 10 would be foolishness for me to, to do that one day. So you, you, you might want to raise to yourself for the 26th Break Free Conference. We're calling, we're calling it the Break Free Conference. Uh, so th that's my marketing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I'm actually, we, you know, me and Janet, we decided we'll go into fast over the next, uh, you know, three weeks for you because we do want to see you be set free of the bondages that Satan has in your life. We do want to see the Holy Spirit truly set you free from things that are binding you today. Um, so, we're going to pray for you, prepare for you, and we want God to work in your life. Okay? Um, but I just want to give you just into those strongholds that Satan can have. I'm going to spend a little time on a couple of them today. Satan has 10 types of strongholds in our lives. Now, everything that I'm teaching you today has a scriptural backup. The only thing is I will not be able to explain everything except on that day because I'll have more time to you know, open every scripture. But I'll give you hints of where I, you know, we learned from this. There are 10 types of strongholds that Satan... Uh, builds within our lives using lies. Remember that Satan is the father of lies. Satan uses deception to build his strongholds in your life. He will control you through lies. Remember that. Okay? There are 10 types of uh, strongholds that Satan can use in order to control us. Number one, uh, personal. Number two, mental. Personal simply means things to do with our personal lives. Mental simply means things to do with our thinking patterns, thought patterns. Family means things that belong to our family, uh, um, using things of our family to control us, or um, using uh, issues in our family to control us. Then, of course, we, we ideological uh, strongholds, occultic strongholds. Uh, um, uh, some of you may say, I am never used to occults, but actually I'm going to show you that you, some of us are actually occultic. We use occultic practices without knowing. Um, at least in the seminar, I can't do it today, but... Um, but I want, to, uh, I want to talk on that. And social um, strong goals, things like racism, things like um, casteism, things like that. Um, se uh, secular strong goals, sectarian strong goals within the church, like denominationalism, um, you know, Baptists fighting against Pentecostals, Pentecostals fighting against Baptists. Uh, this is the division Satan wants within the church. Okay? Remember that. Uh, while we are supposed to be brothers, sisters in Christ, Yes, of course, we have a different, different view of certain things, but doesn't mean we're supposed to fight against each other. What Satan did is put fights against us within each, uh, each of us, and 
he's probably sitting there and enjoying it while we are fighting it out. Um, territorial uh, strongholds, that means there are areas specifically uh, that are under control of uh, evil spirits, specific evil spirit controlling certain, for example, um, I'll just give one example and then I'll go back. Um, like, um, the, have you seen some areas have families that are su suffering with alcoholism? All those people in that particular area um, uh, um, you know, are drunkards, uh, living in ab abject poverty, destroying everything that God, you know, they have, um, and, and uh, constant fights within the families. Um, so um, we are online, right? And, and, and you would see there are certain monuments there that are dedicated to certain um, fallen angels which control that entire area. You see the monument, you recognize the fallen angel there, you'll know what the problem is in that area. That's all I can say online. There's nothing else I can say. Okay? I'm sure you guys are smart. Uh, the, the, the last one is what we call the seats of Satan. Um, basically, Satan uses institutions uh, to control us, uh, like, uh, like government, like um, um, legal systems, judicial systems, educational systems, and um, entertainment uh, industry to control us. Uh, so th those are some strongholds that, um, that we may be um, suffering with. And I'm, most of us are set free for many of us, many of them, but we still may have certain things that are keeping us um, under the control of Satan. So I want to explore just the first three of them uh, for today's sake, because I think it would be apt for me to uh, touch those three areas. Now, um, second, it's, it's good for, for me, second service is good because I don't have to write again. Um, you know, um, so y there you go. But the, the problem is you lose suspense. Um, the first one, let's look at the personal strongholds. When I say personal strongholds, uh, one of the things that, um, that Satan can use in your life are hidden and unconfessed sins. Hidden and unconfessed sins. Let me explain that to you in a, in a, in a manner that you can understand. It could be possible that some of you have had an illicit relationship at a thought level, at a heart level, at a physical level. At some point in your life, that you've been unfaithful to your spouse. And you just, you know, forgotten about that. It, it could be in the form of sexting. Um, because that's the language that we are using right now, right? Um, it could be in the form of image. It could be in the form of um, physical touch. Unfaithful to your wife or husband, but never talked about it after that. Um, because you thought it's just one time occasion and I just was so weak to, uh, in, in, in during that, that, that phase of my life. If, if you did not confess it to your spouse or somebody who is above you, your spiritual authority, uh, it's, I, I can understand the shame. But if you don't confess with God, who knows everything about you, then there is a problem. That unconfessed sin, hidden sin inside you, is the one thing that Satan can use to control you at some point in your life. The same image, same sex, same uh, person can be brought back into your life at, at a place where you probably are experiencing a spiritual eye, and then, bang, the, the, the attack on you uh, can become uh, the control of Satan over your life. Make sense? If you don't confess it. To Jesus. The moment you confess your sin to Jesus, you're set free because God chooses to forgive you and forget what you have done. Which simply means next time when something like that happens, you can freely, boldly stand up against it and say, yeah, I did. But I spoke to God. I received forgiveness. 
you don't have to be guilt ridden anymore sometimes in guilt we sin more you know that satan is an expert in doing that make you feel guilty in such a way that you will feel i have already done that why not do it one more time not like you want to do it but you just feel like doing it again because you feel like i've already done that what's the big deal about it or maybe i'm just like this so this this you, uh so if you are suffering with any if you still harboring any sin unconfessed sin in your heart deal with it today um it could be uh, emotional instability emotional instability simply means you have this uh extreme emotional state on one day you're really happy and the other day you're really depressed and most of your uh, most of the time your life is decided by the way you feel not by truth not by fact but by the way you feel and because you make decisions based on how you feel you mess up a lot of things you know it the people who are affected by you know it and the, the repercussions are much bigger than what you think and because the repercussions are more you feel sad and make more decisions which are more worse making sense emotional instability what holy spirit does is bring balance to our life he bring first of all he helps us to confess our sin when we don't know how to confess our sin he in fact confesses on our behalf and helps us to be free then he brings balance to our life emotional stability to us so you won't be swayed by anybody who can speak nicely to you or harshly to you um or destructive or harmful behavior patterns that you know these are some things that in your life that you should not be doing but you keep doing them knowing that these are bringing destruction to me like pornography like um uh, you know things that um you know that you know you shouldn't be doing but are pulling you back into that again and again you you blame it on God, uh, satan you blame it on evil spirit but actually it's your choice again by the way you are the one who is allowing him to influence you to go and do it and so when you do that don't don't blame satan you are you made the choice okay um, destructive behavior patterns and then of course um, your past experiences there's a possibility that some of us still uh, are 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 controlled by what happened in our past good or bad um and that's that can control us control our decision making process that can control us in doing what uh, from stopping us from uh, to stopping us from doing what god wants us to do in the present because of what happened in the past satan is an expert in using this making you feel guilty making you uh, vulnerable into submitting to what he is asking you to do that makes sense these are personal strong words i'll 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 give you more scriptural um you know examples from from the scripture itself when we come back on 26th but you know just wanted to give you the taste of um, of this then the next one is what we call mental strongholds mental strongholds are are to do with thinking patterns thoughts your thoughts like ungodly thoughts like things that are in contrary to the scripture um things that are based on false teaching like now i i god doesn't want us to be poor by the way i know that god broke poverty on the cross poverty is a curse i believe in that i believe god wants us to be blessed live blessed live to full potential God wants us to intentionally live a sacrificial life which simply means even though i can live in luxury i choose not to live in luxury that is intentionally self sacrifice self sacrifice right you understand so a lot of people who are in ministry are intentionally self sacrificing not that they they cannot live a blessed life but they chose to be poor not because they are poverty stricken they chose to be poor because that's the context they are serving made sense so technically god doesn't want us to be poor 
poverty is a disgrace to um, you know to the name of god himself god is a you know god of blessing god wants us to have plenty but he wants us to learn to be sacrificial he wants us to be people who will say i'm content with what i have when you do that no you become a blessing to others god uses you to become a channel to others to become a channel of blessing to others. you you see the difference now okay so he he wants us to be prosperous he wants us to be he doesn't want us to be poor but when you take the teaching to the either this extreme or that extreme you you are building your life on false teaching um contrary to the scripture now i gave a, a christian example and i i know there there may be plenty examples of ungodly thoughts uh, like jesus simply said if you look at a woman in a lustful way you are as good as an adulterer or if you hate your brother here you are his murderer um things that are contrary to the scripture ungodly thoughts and then um the second one is traumatic memories uh our memories control us and decide the way we behave in this world right now so i've got an example i'm going to give it, give that example so you understand this now um most of you if you've been here for some time now you you know that i i, I talked about me being adopted into my family uh, into a christian home i'm i'm a pastor's kid adopted into a pastor's home um when my physical biological parents died they adopted me into this home now all my life i grew up losing people all my life i mean i can be i can say 90% of people who i loved who i cherished always left me or died uh, i i've i've always grown up knowing that people eventually will leave me people will eventually reject me so uh when i was adopted into this this family i stayed away from my mother the one who adopted me not because i didn't love her not because i don't like her not because i'm grateful for the love that she's extending to me i simply don't want to get attached to her because i know i'm good at losing people and so uh, uh, you know i i saw my physical mother biological mother um committing suicide right in front of my eyes uh, and so uh, that memories is, is is stuck with me all my life and i thought nah never get attached to people uh never love them more than what is necessary don't um man if if that is what love is called anyway basically don't get attached to people and so i i always grew up um, i mean when i came into this home uh, for the first 10 years that i was there i just didn't want to have anything to do uh, getting close to her um because why get close to her and lose her anyway um but the, but the year that i accept i i accepted the call of god upon my life and committed to full time ministry and i could see the joy on my mom's face my mom loved uh, uh, loved me that's when i knew she loved me more than uh, i ever imagined and i know she prayed for me i know she prayed she fought with god to to use me to serve him and uh, when i decided that i'd go to full time ministry uh, she was she was in cloud 9 now i know how how because she took me for shopping now she never does that now I'm, my brother and my sister are very close to my mom so they generally they are the ones who go out and for my christmas shopping she would she would buy she would buy not me but she would buy she would go you know in those days getting a kumar shirt is like a it's some of you like what is kumar <laughs> <laughs> really you're not born so don't worry about that you know charma shirt is like uh, like whatever <laughs> you know the branded shirt now uh, so um that that would be once in a you know year occasion for us and even that i would generally go with the family but never actually you know with her but the day i i i committed to full time ministry and i wanted to go to bible school and i got the admission to bible school she took me uh, on a shopping spree not with others it's only me and my mom and we had this conversation on in the auto and 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 in the tailor shop and 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 you know she would she brought all kinds of clothes for me and 
bagged my luggage and sent me to Bible school. Um, um, uh, uh, in the first year of my Bible school, almost every two months she would end up in the Bible school um, uh, to travel to Bangalore and be there for two days and, and just, just check on me and how am I doing and what's happening with my life and all that, the first entire first year. In the second year of my Bible school, I, uh, I, was, uh, um, you know, I was operated with the appendix. So I, was in the hospi- I was in the hospital. And um, one of my lecturers, um, who was a uh, you know, dean, student dean at the time, came to, came to hospital. And, and I thought he was just generally visiting me. I said, you know, you're, you need to go to Hyderabad. And you need to go quickly. Uh, your dad wants you to be there. Um, and so you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, my dad you pulled the string. So he's, instead of being in the hostel, I can now go home kind of thing, right? So and then they took me straight to um, uh, Marathali Airport. Now, you, you need to know. That's my first time to, uh, to, to, go, to go to an airport. And they put me in the, uh, in the flight, and one of my friends had joined me. And I thought, man, these guys are treating me really royally. And, and I reached Hyderabad, and there was a vehicle waiting for me to get inside. Bible school had a you know, tempo traveler, and, I, and they took me inside. And then just as I was traveling, I could see everybody sad. And I, I, I had a doubt, but I thought I was sick, so maybe they're sad because I'm sick. Then uh, one of the pastors who was in the car just turned to me and said, uh, um, Chai, uh, he would call me Chai. So he would say, Chai, d- don't, don't feel sad. Um, we're going to see mom. Uh, mom went to be with the Lord. Um, she died of a, of a cardiac arrest. She was young. She was 50 years old. I was young. And I'm, man, I'm hurt again. That's not good. So I hated getting close to people after that, even more. Took another four years in a, in a youth camp, where, which I was conducting. The youth camp, I became the youth director for the Assemblies of God uh, for, for both the states at that time. In 2003, we were doing a youth camp. And one of the youth camps, God began to minister to me. While everybody is in the altar, they were you know, receiving the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Some of them speaking in tongues. There was worship going on. I'm sitting at the back. I'm trying to make sure the camp is going well. Um, but there, sitting there, God began to speak into my heart and restore me. Our traumatic experiences can control us all our life till we allow the Holy Spirit to heal our wounds. The fact that my mom died, the fact that my adopted mom died, the fact that I still lose people is true. But it doesn't hurt me anymore. Not because I became uh, emotional, but, but because I understand that it's part of life. I understand it's part of our journey as a human being. Our traumatic experiences can become controlling factors in our journey. And they can stop us from doing what God really wants us to do. Make sense? So um, I, the, the next one is fears. Of course, you, you, you understand what I'm talking about, fears. We'll keep talking about fears always anyway. So I'm, I'm just skipping that. Um, a poor self-image. Um, you, you know, the, most of us, many of us, live with a very poor self-image. We feel like we are not, we are not good enough. Somebody taught us that. Remember that. I'll talk about it in the next point. But somebody told us that we are not good enough. And we learned not to be good enough because we think we are not good enough. And then uh, the last one, I want to highlight that part. Uh, It's called victimization. Victimization is a state of behaving like a victim. A lot of Christians live like they're victims. Victimization is a place where you're saying, you know, everybody's against me. My own family is against me. My friends are against me. Well, they're not my friends anyway. Uh, so, you know, you, you're always constantly thinking everybody's against you and you are the only victim there. You're constantly thinking system is against you, uh, justice is against you. People who are supposed to bring you justice are standing against you. You're living with the constant sense of being victimized by everybody. Government, system, uh, uh, community, family, friends, church, everything. You are constantly living with that. Truth is you are not a victim. 
The day you came to, you may be a victim because of system in this world, the unjust system in this world, and the evil in this world, but you're not a victim when you came to Christ. The day you came to Christ, you are a victor. Because the one who is inside you is greater than the one who is outside in the world. You are not a victim anymore. Maybe you were a victim, but you are not a victim anymore. You don't, you know, you don't keep complaining that, you know, I actually come from a very poor background. That's why my status is like this. I come from a, a you know, because we're in Indian context, I'm just saying this, okay? Please do not uh, misunderstand what I'm saying. Uh, I come from this particular community. We, we are so backward that, you know, really we never had chances. We ne we, that's why I'm here like this. No, not anymore. You have Christ in you. You don't identify yourself anymore with the community that you come from, a caste that you belong to, or the background with which you grew up. No more. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul declares who you are. He says, even before the foundations of the earth were laid down, Father saw us through Christ and chose us. Every one of you, chosen by God. Pigged, chosen, you know what it means, right? Chosen means, you're like pigged, pigged by God, pigged by God, each of you. Chosen, by, that's your identity, not your community. Not what um, Indians are branding you to be, or, uh, or others are branding you to be. You are what God says you are, you're a chosen one. He goes on to say, now that you accepted Jesus, you are adopted into the family of God. Do you know what it means? It means you once you belong to somebody else, now you belong to me. You come under my family, under my name. You are adopted into the family. When I, when I was sharing my story um, uh, with Pastrinvas, Srinivas Anna, who was here with us for our anniversary program, uh, he was talking to me and he said, you know, you should, if, you ever, if ever you write an autobiography, title your, your book as Twice Adopted. <laughs> wow, that's a good one. I like it. You're adopted into the family of God. Now you belong to God. No, but that's not enough. That's not where Paul stops. He goes on to say this. Now that you are in the family of God, you inherit everything Christ has as a, as a child of God. And he marked you with the Holy Spirit. Means God put a stamp on your face saying, don't you dare touch my child to Satan. That's why Satan is afraid of you. You don't know that part. Because you, you carry the mark of God on you, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Chosen, adopted, marked. If ever you you have a self poor self image, or if ever you feel like a victim, remember I'm chosen, I'm adopted, I'm marked. Chosen by Father, adopted because of Jesus Christ, marked by the Holy Spirit. That's who we are, and because we don't realize the truth in that, we live like victims always. Um, the last one is what we call, want to call uh, family strongholds. When I use the word family strongholds, I'm talking about things that control and influence families itself. For generations together. Have you ever seen a family with a history of alcoholism inside it? Great-grandfather is a drunkard, died with a lung cancer. Grandfather is a drunkard, died with a lung cancer. Father is a drunkard, struggling with lung cancer. Son is now become the drunkard. Just carrying the addictive tendencies for generations together. This is what Bible calls a curse. In Exodus chapter 20, um, 
verses 5. God says idolatry brings generational curses into families. What you do against God, meaning when you replace God with something else as, as your idol, that begins to control your life, your family, your children, their children, and their children for four generations. That is what we call generational curse. And it is a true thing, by the way. It's not some vague idea. It's actually true. That if we don't deal with generational curse, we will carry them with us, then pass it on to our children. So addictive tendencies, something like alcoholism, or moral impurity, something like adultery, adulterous relationships. If you, some of you, if you can recognize this, Maybe not in your family, but in somebody else's family cycle, you'd see father maintaining two families, grandfather maintaining two families, and you will realize even great grandfather had two families. And then you got untold cousins everywhere. <laughs> Everybody is introducing themselves as cousins, and you're like, "Whoa, wait a second! I, I know, I, I, you know, I want." <laughs> I, I know I made it sound like a comedy, but it actually is a curse. Adulterous uh, relationships, adultery, uh, moral impurities that control us, um, then uh, the con that pass on to the uh, families, and then um, excessiveness, everything excessive. You know, something like o overeating, gluttony, causing um, bodily harm to us. Now, I understand, you know, there are some physical reasons why is, you know, some of us can get affected because, either because of thyroid or something like that. There may be some really genuine medical reasons. But, but there are some people who you watch them. Families together are obese because of gluttony, excessive eating, excessive uncontrollable desire and uncontrollable appetite. Am I making sense to you? Please don't get offended by me. Today, even if you get offended, I just can't do anything about it. But I really want you to see the truth. Or overworking, obsessive working, obsessive working. That we are not satisfied with eight hours of work. We want to do 12, we want to do 16 hours. If possible, we want to carry our laptop into our bedroom um, and stay awake all night. Don't care about spouse, don't care about children, don't care about the kind of effect it'll have on them. I don't care, I want to, I want to do this. It's unhealthy obsessiveness with, um, with work. God told you to work eight hours a day, by the way. Just work eight hours a day. You will, you will have exact amount that you need after working eight hours. <laughs> he will satisfy you. He will satisfy you. And he will give you your dream house. He will give you your dream car. He will give, make sure your children are taken care if you work only eight hours. If you, if you work 12 hours, the extra four hours money, you know, it's, it's gone. Before you blink your eyes. It's gone. It's gone because of unrecognized, undiagnosed sickness. Suddenly you will experience sickness. You don't, you're working hard, working 12 hours, 16 hours, making money. You saw money in the bank. Next morning you're in the hospital paying all that money there. <laughs> it's true. Remember that. Eight hours a day you work, you take care of your family after that. God will give you enough money to take care of you, your family, your children. For next thousand generations. I'll show that to you in the scripture. Okay? Um, excessive. <laughs> number four. Sorry for being very ruthless today. Um, number four. Criminal behavior. Um, that violent families begot violent families, by the way. Okay? Um, you will see uh, families with criminal history. Continuously. Without if there is no breaking of chain, that is what will happen. That's why... Villages, villages become 
you know. I'm glad God saved Stuart from, but <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. Villages, villages are. Families, fam all of them, by the way, that entire village would be linked to each other. The entire village would be families, actually. All of them suffering with the same problem. Um, stubbornness, rebellious streak in families. Uh, rebelliousness, that nature, that I don't want to listen to authority. I don't like to be under authority. I want to do my own thing. Father teaches the son, son teaches to his son. Father learned it from his father, that is grandfather, and grandfather learned it from great grandfather. Right? I want to be my own, who are you to tell me? Kind of mindset, right? Some of you may be thinking, I'm, I'm really independent. No, you're not. You're just rebellious. Just learn to be humble. Obey. Your parents obey the spiritual authority. Otherwise, you'll not break the cycle. Just not break the cycle. That's the problem with the judges. By the way, the book of Judges, that is the problem. The streak of rebellious nature. Uh, fathers were rebellious, sons became rebellious. Sons were rebellious, their children became rebellious. Generations after generations, the whole cycle you'll keep seeing all through the book of Judges. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I just want to just focus on the last one. I'm, I'm not trying to scare you, but have you ever seen a lot of us um, um, must have watched some people Always an accident. Always experience some kind of accident. Even for small things. They'll, they'll probably just hit a speaker on the way and then break, his, break their hands. I mean, normally it doesn't happen to you, but, but some people. And every time you see them, either they have a bandage here, bandage here, bandage here, bandage here, bandage here, here. And you're like, What's wrong with you, man? Can't you, can't you walk straight? And they'd be like, I am walking straight. But I don't know why I keep getting walls. We, we had somebody like that in our church. We prayed over that person. Um, and we, you know, we did a conference called Restoration uh, many years ago. And we, we saw that literally and how God broke that bondage. Curse upon that person. Uh, so these are what we call Generational curses. Now you could be looking at me and saying, but we are in the church, we are Christians. How could you talk about curses? Of course, that is true. Christ broke every single curse at the cross. You don't have to live under that curse. The thing is, even though we don't have to, we still live like we are under the curse. That is the lie that I'm talking about. Christ broke every single curse upon the cross. What you have in front of you is the symbol of the curse being broken and the blessing being released upon you. At the, at the cross, Bible says, at the cross, Christ became the curse for us. These curses that I just talked about. Christ became the curse for us at the cross and broke every single one of them. So what your father is, you don't have to be. What your great grandfather is, you don't have to be. You can be different. You will set a new set of chain of events from now. The day you come to the cross and say, God, I lay down my problems at your feet. Would you break these bondages? Would you break this curse? Christ will break them and set a new, completely new chain of events in your life. Do you know what Bible says? When you obey the word of God, these blessings will overtake you, not only you, but will follow you for the thousand generations. Your choice today not only brings blessing into your life, but to your children. Your children won't become like your grandfather. Your children will be different, blessed. Their children will be blessed. And their children will be blessed because of you. Because you chose to break the curse at the cross today. Because you are saying, God, I'm placing my life at your feet. I don't want to be what my father is. I don't want to be what my mother is. I don't want to be what my grandfather is. I want to be a different person. I want to live curse-free, blessed life because I want to be a blessing to the next generation. Christ has already made a path. You just have to accept it. As long as you don't take the truth in, 
you will live and suffer under the, under the curse. That you don't have to. You don't have to. Make sense? I want to close with, um, uh, you know, with, with, a, with, a, with just showing you the signs of a curse in a family. Just in case you are experiencing them, this is a good day to bring them uh, to cross. And I think it's necessary for me um, to just show that. I know I already did my conclusion, but I just want to show you seven signs of a curse in our lives. Okay? Number one, um, frequent mental breakdowns. If you're constantly suffering with depression, mental breakdowns, emotional breakdowns, you really need to bring it at the, at the cross. You don't have to suffer like that. You don't have to. You don't have to let anybody tell you who you are. Believe what God says who you are. You're free. If the Christ sets you free, you're free indeed. You're called to live a free life. Okay? Don't let uh, mental breakdowns affect your life. Um, chronic, undiagnosed, unrecognized sickness. Have you ever seen family members who are suffering and you just don't know why they're suffering physically? And you, you feel like, this is, doctors are like, oh, we don't know what's happening. We're giving everything we can. I mean, we treated you in any way possible with um, undiagnosed sicknesses. Um, um, number three, um, I, I can't even read my own writing. Um, barrenness, barrenness. You understand what barrenness is, right? Some of us may be struggling with barrenness. Um, now, sometimes God delays, okay? Please don't take that. Um, don't read in too much into what I'm saying. Sometimes God allows barrenness because he wants to teach us something. Like in the case of Hannah, because he wanted to bring Samuel out. Like in the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, he purposefully delayed giving a child because he wanted to bring the child at the right time. Okay? John the Baptist. But sometimes, barrenness is the... Well, I didn't say that. Bible says that. Barrenness is a sign of curse. That God will withhold giving you a child because of a sin. A bondage inside your life. Um, number four, frequent marital um, relationship problems. Man, I understand we are human beings. I understand we live in a in an unbalanced world. Now, I know we're going to fight. I'm a married one, so I know what I'm saying. Okay? We know we're going to fight. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's how we learn to forgive each other and keep growing. Right? Ma marriage means you're, you're, while you have great, great, wonderful times, you're also going to have times of um, uh, struggles. Um, but if you're experiencing frequent marital problems and you have not dealt with that, and you are on the verge of breaking away from your relationship, man, you really got to work on that. Every single day, work on your marriage. Every single day. Because every single day, you're going to fight. So every single day, that's why Paul taught us, don't go to bed without forgiving each other as a husband and wife. Because you don't want to carry the curse to the next day. You don't want your children to learn from your fights and then treat their wives and their husbands like that. You don't want to. Of course you're going to fight, but, you know, finish it. Quickly. Get back. Love each other more. If you don't deal with your marriage, man, it's going to be, become a curse to your family. Um, violent and unnatural deaths. That is, if you watch consistent violent deaths within the family, are unnatural deaths. I mean, you know, what is natural death? You grow old and you die. That's natural death. Okay? But unnatural death is meeting an accident and dying in, in such a way that you did not even imagine. Okay? Kind of violent and unnatural deaths. If you're watching that, that means you need to work on that. I mean, obviously you can't do anything about it. You have to bring it to, to the cross. Uh, ac being accident prone, I just uh, talked about that. And then, of course, um, lack of Achieving success. God wants us to be successful. Remember that. We are vic victors. I do. You remember that? God said to Joshua, everything your hand finds to do, I will bless it. Every place you set your foot on, I'll bless that place. 
because of you. Which means there is no bad place in this world. Every place you go becomes yours. Every work that you do, God will bless it. So there is no big job, small job, holy job, unholy job. <laughs> job is a job. It gave you work. So work. But in spite of so much of work, you still, you know, don't achieve success. And you feel like a failure constantly. And if that is happening constantly, there is something that you need to deal with spiritually. Deal with that. Go to God. Put that at the feet of Christ. The cross is a good place. Today is a good place. Good time. You know, as the, as the, as the bread and the cup come to you today. And, um, you know, before you partake in communion, you know, what you need to be and I need to be grateful of is, is the fact that we are not under curse anymore. That not only Christ saved us from our sin, but he set us free of the curse. Anything, any curse, any kind of curse, there's no more. That doesn't have any hold on us, no effect on us. We are sealed, marked by the Holy Spirit, which means we are now free from all this, all the past, all the traumatic experiences, all the mental barriers, all the personal sins. If you have an unconfessed sin today, before you partake in communion, ask God to forgive you. Nobody will understand you, except for God. Right? Nobody knows your heart. Only God knows your heart. So when you say sorry and truly sorry, he understands you. And he understands why you did what you did. He saw you doing it. And he will choose to forgive you because he promises that to us. If any one of you have sinned, let him confess, the Bible says. And the Father will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He's going to clean you up completely. So you don't need somebody's approval. You just need Jesus today. So ask Jesus to come into your heart. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, and you kind of realize that some of those things are the things that you're struggling with, today come to Jesus. Uh, and accept Jesus as your savior. And you may say, I don't know how to do that. You don't have to do anything. You just have to say, I'm sorry for what I've done. Would you, Jesus, forgive me and come into my heart? He will come into your heart. And there will begin a transformation process inside you. God begins a change in, inside you. And he will transform it. And now, a curse that you were are going to become a blessing. Because Christ took that curse away from you. So I want to give that opportunity to you. As the worship team sings, would you just close your eyes? And would you just lay down anything that you recognize in this three things that I talked about that are that have become strongholds, would you just lay them down at the feet of Christ? Before you partake in communion today, would you just ask Jesus to break those curses upon you? Take away those strongholds. Help you to live a free life, a blessed life that he's offering you. Would you do that? Just a small prayer, short prayer. Thank you, Jesus.